In this lesson, we're going to see how we can work with arrays. We're going to do a lot of traversals, and this is going to point out a very important fact about arrays. Again, the memory is contiguous, which means that we can index through the data, and what is most suited for this, of course, is a loop and a counting loop, the for statement. You'll see the for statement being used multiple times to traverse arrays for various tasks. And we're going to begin with a traversal simply to read in some information from users. We've declared a constant size to be 5, an array of ages of size 5, and initialize them all to 0. We have a sum, an average we set to 0, and then a for loop that's going to traverse the array. Now again, remember that the indices on the array run from 0 to size minus 1. This is extremely important. Look at the for loop. We start our index at 0 and go up to but not including size. It's extremely important. And again, I'm going to point out the utility of declaring that size as a constant. Suppose that I don't have 5 people but 50 people. I can change it in one spot and everything changes. The declaration and the traversal change and no other change has to take place. It's very simple. Let's run through this. With i equal to 0, I'm going to look at the 0th element. I will prompt for and enter an age for the first person. That's going to be 12. Increment to 1. Read in 15. Increment to 2. 31. Increment to 3. 18. Increment to 4. And enter 14. So I've run through the array completely from i equals 0 to i equal to 4, which is less than size. As soon as I go up to 5, I'm no longer less than size, and I'm out of that loop. Okay, second traversal, same array. Again, a for loop, and I'm going to go from 0 up to, but not including size, is extremely important. So I'm traversing the array from the 0th to the 4th element. I'm going to sum up the ages. So for i equal to 0, I have sum is 0. I'm going to add in 12. I'm going to add in 15. I'm going to add in 31. Add in 18. Add in 14. And my sum is 90. I'm going to calculate the average to be 90 divided by 5 is 18 and output that. For our third traversal, I'm going to find the maximum value in the array. What I'll do is I'm going to, I'm going to write this code to emulate the way I would do it if I was a human being. And this is what you want to do quite often with your code. Take a look at what you do. Remember what we did in the first lesson? We looked at algorithms. If I give you this array and ask you find the maximum value, what do you do? Well, you look at the first element and say, okay, this is the biggest one so far. I'm going to hold on to that. You look at the second, 15. Okay, that's bigger. I'm going to replace that 12. 31. Ah, oh, that's bigger. That's now the biggest one. 18, no, that's not bigger. 14, no, that's not bigger. 31, that was the biggest one, I remember. What you did was you held on to each item as you went, and if you found something that was bigger, you replaced it. That's exactly what your code is going to do. So you have to sl slow down, sometimes slow down your thinking process and write code that emulates that process. So look at our for statement here. We're going to start at i equal to 1 now. Now, why 1? Well, because... I set my maximum to be ages 0, the very first element. I don't need to look at it. So I'm going to start at 1 and go up to, but not including size again. If I went up to an included size, then I'd be looking at memory out here that's not mine. So for i equal to 1, is ages 1 bigger than max? Yes, it is, so I'm going to assign it to max. Increment to 2. I ask the question, is it bigger? Yes, so assign it. Up to 3, is ages 3 bigger than max? The answer is no. Go to 4. Is that bigger? No. And I'm done. I output what the max of the array is. For our next traversal of this very same array, I'm going to sort it. This is actually a coding of the sorting algorithm we know as bubble sort. All right? It's a loop inside of a loop, a for loop inside of a for loop. The outer loop names how many, how many times I'm actually going to traverse the data. The inner loop is going to do the work. So for each j, I'm going to ask, is 
ages j bigger than ages j plus 1. I'm going to compare these very first two elements. Is 12 bigger than 15? If it is, I'm going to swap it. That's what the code below is. If it's not, I'm going to leave it alone. It's not, so I'm going to increment j up to 1 and look at ages j and j plus 1. So is 15 bigger than 31? No. I increment to j equal to 2. Ask the question, is ages 2 bigger than ages 3? The answer is yes. So I need to swap these two values. 31 goes up, 18 goes back. I declare a, a temporary variable called swap. I'm going to assign it 31. I'm going to assign 18 to ages 2. And then I'm going to move that swap into ages 3. So I've held on temporarily to the lower value, move the, the higher value in, and then assign that lower value up. OK, increment j to 3. Ask the question, is ages 3 bigger than ages 4? It is, so I'm going to swap. OK, create the temporary variable, move that one down, move it in, and we're swapped. j is 4. That is now no longer less than size minus i, i being 1, and so I'm ready to move on. I'm going to increment i to 2, so this is a second traversal. I'm going to do everything again. What have I accomplished so far? So far, the largest value is at the top of the data set. This is why it's called a bubble sort. I'm going to look at this data next, and then I'm going to look at these, and then I'm going to look at these, and then last but not least that. That's the outline of what happens. So for i equal to 2, again, j is 0. Is age is 0 bigger than age is 1? No. Move up. Is 15 bigger than 18? No. Move up. Is, uh, age, is 18 bigger than 14? Yes. So I'm going to swap them. Now j is 3. And I'm done. I'm going to increment i to 3 and look at only these values. Again, I ask, is 12 bigger than 15? No. Next, is 15 bigger than 14? Yes, so I will swap. And then j is 2, and I'm done with that iteration. Increment i to 4, j equal to 0. Is 12 bigger than 14? The answer is no. Increment j to 1, and I'm done. Increment i to 5, and I am done. And this is bubble sort. OK, how do we send arrays to functions? Arrays is parameters. There's several points to be made here. If you want to send an array to a function, then I guess the very first thing I would think about is, this is a print array function. All it's going to do is print the array. So I want to put a constant on that variable. I'm not going to change the array, so make it a constant. All right, in this case, it's going to be an array of floats. I'm going to call the parameter the array. And in order to tell the compiler that it is an array that it is to be expected here. I've got to put that open and close brackets. Do you put anything in the brackets? No. Nothing should go in the brackets. You might think, well, shouldn't I put the size of the array? But that doesn't make sense because that would imply that this function only works for arrays of a particular size. And that is pretty useless. So you just put brackets. And then, incidentally, if you put something in the brackets, the compiler will ignore it. Quite often, when you send an array to a function, then you need to send the size of the array also. And of course, that would be declared const and int and size. That gives the information to the function uh, how to traverse, how many elements are in the array, and so how to traverse all of the data. And of course, the code inside the function is a for loop, again, going from 0 up to, but not including size, and simply see out the array i. Now the call to the function. Here in my main, I've declared an array called myArray of size, size, which was a constant declared to be 100. So I'm going to call print array. I send to it myArray. Now, how do I do that? All I have to do is name the array. Okay? You do not want to put brackets there. See? It's really a bad thing. Get the big red arrow. Let's do this again to make sure you understand. Do not put those brackets in there. Okay, and of course we're going to send size. Moving along, preconditions. How do you document a function that takes an array? 
Well, there's an obvious thing here. It must be that the size of the ray has to be a non-negative number. It has to be positive, actually. Okay, so we say parameter size is a positive integer. And array 0 to array size minus 1 must be valid data. So that pretty well lays it out. What has to be true for this to be a reasonable operating function? Okay, let's take a look at bubble sort again. And at this point, it's important to understand just what happens when you send or when you pass an array to a function. It acts very much like pass by reference. Actually, what you're sending is the address of the first byte of the first cell of the array. So when I pass my array to this bubble sort, it will indeed sort the array in the calling function. My array will indeed be different when we return from this function. So it's vitally important that when you've got a function that you send an array to, for instance, this last one here where it's print array, if it's not to change that array, and it is, array, it is an array parameter, it's really important to make that a const, to say, compiler, don't let this change. Okay, so back to our bubble sort. We do not want it to be a constant. We want it to be an array of floats. If we put const on there, then it wouldn't uh, change the array. It wouldn't actually sort it. Uh, the second point I want to make here is, notice this line of code. I replaced the embedded code in our old bubble sort, the swap mechanism, those three lines of code, with a function call here. We, I think I showed you in an earlier uh, lesson, the templated code, how I could swap two variables or two values with a function call. So that makes the code a little bit shorter and a little bit neater. There's one other thing I'd like to do here. I want to show how you would template this code. Instead of just being able to bubble sort uh, an array of floats, I'm going to do it with an array of anything. Here we go. See if I can write this neat enough. I have to tell the compiler that this is a templated function. So I'll write template class and t is my template parameter and that means that it's not float but t. And the only other thing that I need to be careful about is the swap. The swap would have to be templated also. So you'd have to write a templated swap function, which would look something like this. Template class t void swap t reference t1 t reference t2 and the definition. So now I can apply this swapping routine to an array of anything. Here's another function, uh, shift right. I pass an array of ints to it. And what it's going to do is shift everything to the right. So before, it looks like 12, 14, 15, 18, 31. And afterwards, it'll be 12, 14, 15, 18. And sure enough, 12, 14, 15, and 18. And again, if I wanted to template this, then I could write template. And I'll use type name here, or it could be class. Type name T. And this would no longer be an array of ints, but an array of t. And I don't believe anything else has to change. Here we have a function called isFound. I'm going to supply this function with an array of characters. I'm not going to change that array, so slap a const. I send it the size, and I send it a character that I call target. It's not going to change, so I slap a const on that and create a local variable called found, initialize it to false, a counter variable i, initialize it to zero. Jump into a while loop while i is less than the size and found is false. I'm going to ask the question, if target is equal to the array i, then found is true, and then increase or increment i. And it'll run down this array, not with a for loop, but with a sentinel loop, looking to see if target is in the array. And it'll return true if it is, false otherwise. Let's look at a different version of this. 
here I'm going to send back not a bool but an int. That's going to be the position found and it's going to default to negative one. So what's the post condition? The first index position containing the target value is returned. If the target is not found in the array then negative one is returned. So again it simply walks down that array and looks for the target in the array and if it finds it it will return that position and otherwise it's simply going to return negative one. So if you think about how you write your functions you can actually return more information than you might otherwise believe. The first version we sent back true or false. Was it there or was it not? But in the second version we can not only communicate that it wasn't there but also if it's there where it is where its first instance is. So you see there's many many things that you can do with arrays and uh, you're going to find them very very useful in the future in your programming.